I want to welcome you uh, to the uh, deep diving into clinical outsourcing in the era of decentralized clinical trials. And uh, we would like to, we have a really a, a wonderful esteemed panel here, people that have uh, been in the industry for a long time. And uh, we, we actually have gotten to know each other a little bit, which has been very enjoyable. So we're going to start with introductions. And um, I'll go ahead and start since I have the floor, and then I'll pass it on to uh, the rest of the team. My name is Mark Milberg, and I am the Senior Director of Clinical Outsourcing at Ultragenics Pharmaceutical. And we're based in Novato, Novato California. So uh, Jennifer, do you mind going next for us? Sure. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jennifer Lee. I am a uh, executive director, head of oncology, clinical operations at Radius, and Radius is located in Boston. Nice Thank to you meet so you. So we won't talk about diameter. We'll talk about just Radius today, right? That's that's important. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No fraction. No, <laughs> that's small. Joke. Just the Radius. A joke. A bad joke. Okay. Next, let's go, Catherine. Uh, pleasure to see you. Uh, we're just introducing quick introductions, if you will. Hi, my name is Catherine Arbor. I'm the Executive Director of Clinical Data Management at Alexion Pharmaceuticals. Nice Thank to meet you. Thank you so much. Thank great, you. great presentations. Thank you. Orani. <laughs> yes. Hi, uh, my name is Orani Daniels, and I'm the Chief Medical Officer hello, at hello. Antiva Bioscience uh, in the South San Francisco. So uh, we're a virtual biotech startup company. Beautiful. I love your, your background there. Uh, Sandy, would you go next for us? Sure. I'm Sandy M. Bowden, and I'm the head of customer engagement at Clinical Maestro. Wonderful. I love that title. Chantal. Hi, I'm Chantal Feltham, and I'm the president and CEO of Styrus Research. Thank you. And Tracy. Hi, everyone. Tracy Dugan with Wushi Clinical, executive director of proposals and contracts. It's a pleasure to be with you all. Thank you, Tracy. And Courtney. Hi there, Courtney Bryant from Moderna Therapeutics. I'm the Senior Director of Business Operations. And you guys have been very busy. Uh, Rich, can you talk? And, and, okay. And, and, there you go. Can you right hear on. me now? Yes. yes All right. Hey, yes. hey, you know what, Mark? You get you get another <laughs> name in the hat for that one. Right on. Wow. Thanks, everybody. Uh, Actually, I tell you, that was living two. on the fly. Okay, so we, we've, went, we've gone over the agenda. Did yep. we miss Sue? No. Did, did actually, we miss I anyone? Think, I don't think I don't think we've missed anybody. I don't think, so. I don't think, I don't think you've uh, actually gone through the agenda. We just started with the yeah. introduction. Uh, introduce myself. Yeah, uh, I, I am your host, Rich Merg, and uh, I am the uh, VP of Sales and Marketing at BioClinica. If you were on earlier today, you uh, you had a chance to to uh, hear about our CTMS system. Uh, so today we're going to go over uh, uh, several questions. Um, but but um, we're yeah. First of all, uh, we're we're going to have an introduction, and uh, and then we'll go through some poll questions, and then I'm going to give questions to this panel. Okay. So sorry about that uh, uh, that sloppy introduction, but I I was I was missing my. Um, my headset. Okay, so decentralized trials. The COVID-19 pandemic has changed the way we conduct business. Clinical research has had to adopt to an environment where subjects may not be willing to visit a clinical site, or monitor may not be willing to visit a site in person. This has required clinics to visit subjects at their homes or remotely. It has forced monitors to review site operations and source data remotely. Today's discussion will involve professionals throughout the clinical research process and how they have had to alter the way they work to accommodate COVID and the decentralized trial. So, uh, Sam, do you have some poll questions for us? I do. Yes, I do. If you um, you hover your mouse on the right-hand side over polls. And if I'll Sam cover. does not have our poll questions, that'll be a great way to save you. Uh, Sam, do you have some questions for us, or should we just move on? Yeah, I have the questions open right over here. Okay, um, we, we we are going to move on. All right. And uh, 
Rich? Okay, so uh, my first, yes. There is the poll question open on the right-hand side. If you hit polls. No, I, I, oh, okay, okay. I'm sorry. Um, I've got, I've got the, um, the first question I've got has the camera COVID-19 and microphone uh, in front of that. And I'm having a hard time seeing it. The first question is, has COVID-19 There we go. Thank your- you. Okay, everybody. Okay, if everybody could vote on that. Excellent. Okay. Yes, drastically. Poll question number two. Thanks again, Mark. Um, Could we move to question number two? It is showing, Rich. It says, have you adopted new software or procedures to support decentralized trials? There we go. It just came up for me. Thank you. If we could vote now. All right. Um, and uh, uh, 58% of you answered yes. Enough to continue our study. And we have a third question. Have you adopted new software or procedures to support this centralized trial? I'm sorry. Uh, will you continue to use centralized methods in a post-COVID world? There we go. No one's reverting. <laughs> okay, and, uh, and and so this is an interesting thing. Is that uh, we're we're going to be talking a little bit today, uh, ver- various questions. But I've been in a lot of conversations lately, and and and. You know, um, I, I think that things such as uh, as, as e source, right, as uh, remote monitoring, and uh, and and all these things that are kind of um, on the forefront of, of of happening, but yet just haven't happened um, because no one's really wanted to take that step. Um, all of a sudden, we've had to do this, and and uh, and, and now that we've actually done it. Right. And, and we're starting to um, to really break the bounds of uh, of, of um, traditional clinical trials. Uh, I, you know, I think that we're we're here to stay in a decentralized world, which leads us to question number one. Chantal, what are the key lessons learned people need to know to help them maximize their study success during covid? And uh, we'll go with the four minute answer. Four minute, no stealing anyone's time. Um, sure. So we took a look at the studies that have been successfully completed and are being executed. And we looked for things that they had in common. And I wanted to bring these to you because they're, they have three things in common um, over and over again. So the first is there's a significant amount of collaboration going on with external teams. So that is sponsors um, talking with their CROs and other vendors about um, challenging ideas, risk mitigation, blue sky thinking. It's um, working with patient advocacy groups, but not in just general working with them. It's about forming actual relationships. Um, So earlier this week, we had a call from one of our patient advocacy groups who said, hey, calling to give you a heads up that I'm hearing rumblings in our our group that people are worried about uh, participating in clinical trials because they don't know if the drug is going to affect their DNA. Never on our radar, right? They're helping us get ahead of a problem before it actually happens. 
the study coordinators, the collaboration going on there is, you know, we've always done that with them, right? With the, um, with the protocol and how to be most efficient. These are the people that are the game changers in our studies and, and in enrollment. And we need to make sure that we're working with them throughout the study. It's about um, talking with them about how to best take care of the patients and their caregivers. And it, you'll know that you've developed a really good relationship with these guys when they start spontaneously calling you and saying, hey, here's some things that we need to change that will help you retain patients in the study, or if we did this, we could bring more patients in. And by the way, tapping into patients and caregivers is finally happening, okay? Everyone talks about patient centricity. Um, I, I see a lot of people talk about it, but then they start and don't know how to keep it going. You know, we used to get feedback from study coordinators about patient or caregiver feedback, but the things I'm seeing now are, are companies surveying uh, patients and caregivers. How can we serve you better? How could we make participating in this trial better? And if you're going to do that, by the way, you better be prepared to follow through on, on things that they talk about or address the things that you can't follow through on so they know that they're being heard. So in addition to all of these groups collaborating a lot more, what we're finding that successful groups are doing is they are doing collective risk mitigation. So that means we're sharing our risk. We're saying, here's what we're seeing, but we're also saying to all of these different groups, what risks are you seeing? What challenges are you seeing? And, and we're asking them to provide input and solutions. We're not doing it. It's that collaborative building the groups together. So an example we just recently had, um, we're um, instituting home health care in one of our studies. And the PI did not, want to, uh, did not want to sign the delegation of authority log because it had the nurse from the home health care group on the DOA. And the doc is like, I'm not responsible for them. So we got all of the groups together to solve the problem. No silos, no telling people what to do, just everyone collaborating. And everyone in that group had to adapt. And that is the third uh, constant that we're seeing in these successful groups. But when I'm talking about adapting, I'm not talking about adapting the protocol. I'm talking about having teams with an ability to think and pivot quickly and adapt to this ever-changing world. Um, so an example that I have for you, we're running a phase one study and there is a confinement period in this phase one study. So normally what would happen would be you'd say to the subjects, this is when you're coming in and, and they would come in for their, their visits. We switched it around. Now when, when we're having problems with COVID, now the subjects are saying to us, here's my availability. The site is coordinating around them. So there's a flow through that happens there. That means the site has to contact the lab and say, hey, new timing on patients coming through. And now we're gonna have to coordinate kits. We're gonna have to coordinate results. When is the data coming? We have to take that and say to like the DSMB, okay, we need to look at arranging our DSMB dates on here. Um, so that everything can match up. So everyone is pivoting and everyone is adapting constantly. So my, uh, in, I, I have to be up to my four minutes, but those are the three things. If you're doing those in your studies, you are going to be miles ahead. Okay, so th that was really good. Um, thank you for that well thought out answer. And uh, we had Megan Swordstrom, the Vice President uh, uh, of Clinical Development and Operations from Impel Neuropharma. She couldn't be here today because she had an emergency, but uh, that is almost exactly what she said, right? Is, is, that, uh, is that you need to remain uh, yeah, agile. And, uh, and and really, you end up putting a lot of responsibility on your team, and uh, and uh, you know uh, every everyone just really needs to be communicating uh, and and responsible, right? And, and and on top on top of their job. So, uh, very good. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll go to question number two. 
Uh, this will be for first Catherine and then Dr. Daniels. How has COVID-19 impacted the ability to conduct your studies? Yeah, so the first the first challenge we had was actually with our phase one. So Alexion is a rare disease company, ultra rare, rare. We are doing some studies that are no longer rare. However, our phase ones with healthy volunteers, we had to pause those that were active if we couldn't find patients, but we had to go to other areas. So we went to Australia, New Zealand. And we created this predictable model um, using AI, and we brought in COVID sources to find out where COVID was and where it was predicted to go, where we wanted to go with our sites, and then we put it all together. So we, we really have this amazing augmented enrollment type of predictable model based on COVID. So for that, that was great, but phase ones were tough. Our other trials, typical, what everybody had, you couldn't get access, CRAs couldn't get there. So as a data manager, of course, I get hit with, where's the SDV? <laughs> What are you going to do? So we had to change the configuration of our database to change the sequence of what is needed to lock because those databases, those studies that were closing, we created this big uh, PMO that had to go through and look at all of the data and have biostatisticians look at before and after and during. And so we had a very focused, very elaborate process for looking at studies that were ongoing that had major milestones. So something as important as going to a health authority, even if it wasn't a database closure, but we were doing a snapshot, would go all the way up to the top of the organization and we would present all the data inside and out. Um, but ultimately, we did end up using technology like Snap IoT to get in to do informed consents. Now, we did use e consent, and I have to tell you, it's pretty tough in COVID to use e consent. So I've heard us talking about that. That has not been very easy for us on a global scale. So something as simple as not being able to get near the patient who has COVID means that you can't pass a paper back and forth. And that's where SNAP IoT came in and, and we had to, to move things around. So in general, I think we're doing an incredible job at getting patients drug, um, but it's been really difficult to kind of do the study elements of keeping sure that the quality is there and that we're really giving them the, what they deserve to get, as, as was just mentioned by Chantal. They are. They are the most important part of this process. So thank you. Yeah, and, and, and for uh, me. I, uh, I had heard that yesterday. Uh, oh. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry, doctor. Yeah, uh, uh, for me. Uh, uh, my my uh, quick comment was uh, some that I uh, heard about enrollment. <laughs> okay. I look like we might have to do it. Uh, so, so I have a couple of points. Uh, the first thing is uh, Antiva was a semi-virtual company. So we were ahead of uh, where we should be, perhaps. People laugh about it. For a very small company, we run uh, study anything from South Africa, Australia, US. And at one point, multiple uh, studies with uh, employee less than 12 people. So don't ask me how. We don't sleep. But uh, with that, when COVID hit, uh, the platform was already somewhat there. I can't say it's perfect. So from the clean up part, a lot of people call me up and say, how are we going to do this? But because we, uh, Antiwa is a little bit ahead at the time, not by, uh, not by accident anything, we decide to do so. So we had a little bit easier time adapting to the new environment. So using a lot of tools and technology that uh, used to be fancy stuff and it became the norm. So that's number one. Number two, we were in the middle of uh, phase one, which has uh, electric post, uh, surgery. And of course, a non-urgent, non-emergency uh, surgery has to be postponed, prioritized and so on. We got it done. And one thing that we did uh, beside a group of uh, subjects for phase one uh, with you know eight people or six people, we spaced them out. Uh, the cost went up slightly, I have to admit, because uh, normally we want economy of scale. We want lots of people, so the nursing time will be easier. But we managed, and you can open the site on Saturday. Patients love it, too. They don't want to see anyone else. So we spread the enrollment over the same period of time, but uh, have a little couple of small parts. But overall, we get things done, but not the way we used to. Not a cohort of eight people. Did not happen. 
Uh, last but not least, uh, we did not have a sophisticated AI or anything like Catherine uh, mentioned. I actually did it just because uh, my curiosity. We overlay the COVID uh, peak and trough in all area and we manage locations matter. So that's how we did everything beside a little bit advantage. I must say that we were semi virtual before. So our adaptation in the platform might be a little easier. Still have to adapt. Uh, we found out that several SOP at the site or even at the CRO uh, create a little bit of a trouble for us. But for us internally, we were already there. So that's helpful. But with the uh, core, uh, we overlay all the potential sites, potential countries, and we make it, we predict it, and we hit it there, uh, northern, uh, northern hemisphere, southern hemisphere, South Africa, and all of the places that we went have a COVID surge here and there, but we managed to miss it. That's it from me. Uh, it amazing amazing how you both uh you you both almost did the same thing I, I and i heard about that i heard about that yesterday also uh just basically avoiding the covid spikes i mean that that's that's just great business yeah, congratulations you two okay question number 3 for jennifer and sandy what tools have you used to dis to support the decentralized trials Sure, I'll go first. Hi, everybody. Thank you for the question, Richard. So when the, ho when the COVID-19 hit last year, our pivotal phase three trial, global trial, 17 countries and uh, almost 500 patients, we were full enrolling, fully enrolling, and we were uh, pretty comfortable tracking um, and meeting that milestone in the COVID hit. So when when that came, one by one, countries started to shutting down. And that started with Italy and that started with uh, the countries around the region um, started to shut down and they started to restrict the patient visit as well as the on-site monitoring. So we were really much um, hands were tied and we couldn't quite do anything. And South Korea then also stopped on, all on-site visits and Portugal, Brazil started to close their borders. So we were very concerned about the safety of our patients for most. Um, first of all, the current patients that are, that were on the treatment, they needed to get study drug. Um, unfortunately, countries were shutting down. The borders were closed. We couldn't quite penetrate the countries to, to send, um, the supplies through uh, depot as well as, um, you know, patients themselves caught COVID and they couldn't quite make it to the site to get their drug. So we were very concerned about the continuity of the study, but as well as the safety of subjects. So we then started to implement the DTP, the direct to shipment process. So we looked at all the vendors, we identified the vendor and established the process for our sites as well as um, our vendors as to how the drug was going to be supplied uh, first requested and then to deliver um, all of those things were had to be uh, ironed out. And then finally, when we deliver it to the patient's home, whether the patient was going to come and sign the D, uh, the FedEx or DHR, uh, DHL, for example, or we would drop it in front of their home and leave. So all of those logistics had to pan out and ironed out. So the good news is that as of today, we delivered 24 DTP uh, direct to our patients and enrollment successfully completed within the original timeline, despite the COVID-19. So um, we were quite uh, pleased and surprised of all of the successes that we had. But um, yeah, I mean, the, all of the details we needed to figure out in IR, IRB, the ethical committees, they all needed to be notified of what we were doing. So in the end, we used DTP as well as we also use EPRO as well. Okay, so um, thanks for sharing that, Jennifer. I think that those are really important things that you talked about. And um, so I also have a little bit of a background in vaccines. And so the idea of we would try to follow flu season so it's interesting to see the exact opposite happening for other trials. 
Um, in terms of um, some of the other areas that I saw of tools and technology coming into play, as we think about the patients, we think about the sites, but before you could really make any of those decisions, we saw a lot of scenario planning and having access to software and sophisticated systems to really model what your studies might look like in terms of changing regions or country mix, in terms of being able to say, okay, we're gonna slow down enrollment on this trial because now there's a COVID trial that we need to prioritize. So we saw a lot of scenario planning, being able to quickly do that, and then um, using workflow in terms of sourcing to get those trials up quickly and get those started. On a personal note, um, I just wanted to share that, you know, I've had about 30 years in, the, in clinical research and I decided to enroll in a study. So from a wearable devices, I have a ring, an aura ring, and I enrolled in a completely decentralized um, study to look at symptoms, self-reported sim symptoms, as well as the actual data from my ring. I agreed to share that, have it, you know, be used. Um, and it's just, it's been amazing to do that. I'm actually on my second, um, I rolled over into the second branch of the study. So um, in terms of how they made that easy, I mean, I've had a medical writing team, I've worked in project management with e-consent and all of that, but they, it came right in on an app, you know, I had a PDF that I would go and DocuSign just like we do contracts. Um, but it's, it's very interesting to see that coming into play. And I think that that's something where, you know, they kept track of my heart rate, you know, also blood pressure, all those sorts of things just from a wearable that's pretty easy. So I do think that we are on the cusp of more and more things like this coming into play. And I think the key will be how do we yeah. capture that? How do we leverage that? Because people have had to work smarter, figure things out, and it would be great to really see that continue. So we're able to pass that um, shorten timelines, focus on the patient, put effort there. Um, that's really what we all want to do anyway. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, uh, and uh, I, w once again, I really appreciate the effort that everyone put into these, uh, these answers. This is really an informative uh, half hour. So thank you. Okay, so question number four is for Janie and Courtney. Will you continue to use these tools in a post-COVID era? So this is Courtney. I oh, can we start. might have lost Janie. I think they lost Janie. Yeah, there you are. Yeah. Okay. I can kick this off. Yep. I work at Moderna. And um, what will we use in a post-COVID era? Well, this was our first phase three trial. And uh -huh. we have, <laughs> we were a phase one, two company pre-COVID with a massive technology platform that we have uh, leveraged. So we really, as an organization, tapped into our patient centricity and diversity in patients enrolling in our clinical trials to represent the patients that were hit most by the disease. And that is an infrastructure that we continue to build and leverage using um, not only AI and machine learning, but um, through there was a lot of collaboration with external partners and a lot of community outreach with um, the communities that were hardest hit. So the diversity and inclusion in clinical trials will certainly be a major initiative for us going forward. As it was also our first phase three, we implemented some alternative monitoring strategies, uh, remote monitoring, the, the usual um, pieces, uh, as well as robust risk management programs. We have a dedicated clinical risk manager that uh, supported the trial, which was great, as well as the technologies of EPRO, and we leveraged some of our digital colleagues for forecasting for supply and geographical regions as well. So almost everything we did on this trial, I think we will continue on the rest of our uh, journey. All right. And question number five uh, for our purchasing folks. Um, 
Mark and Tracy, how are you procuring vendors to support decentralized trials moving forward? Thank you, Rich. Um, I'm with uh, Ultragenics Pharmaceutical, which is a small uh, biotech specializing in rare and ultra rare diseases. So to start with, we formed a COVID-19 task force that was cross-functional with data management, safety, um, clinical development, you know, the, the physicians and so forth, and really just started documenting all of the challenges that we were having. And it started to frame in for my piece of the my role in that was to develop a vendor uh, update summary and used it as a springboard to actually then look at where we could go after COVID-19 hopefully goes away or at least calms itself down to where we can start to adapt our uh, trial activity to start to use uh, these types of vendors. So we We've, we've, we've researched a lot of different types of scenarios. Um, part of the issue for me is the continuity of certain systems and the ability to work with certain vendors um, can get a little dispar disparate at times. And I know the industry is desperately trying to improve all that, uh, but it's been a challenge from a purchasing position to try to make sure that we land in the right way. We don't want to waste money or time. So the, mm -hmm. the COVID-19 task force has been ideal. We started looking at uh, e-consent and we, we ran into a number of different uh, roadblocks there. We are looking at telemedicine opportunities. We're looking at different ways, um, uh, virtual conference meetings, as well as data aggregation and data visualization. And we also have developed an internal, uh, in what we're calling innovation lab, that's developing um, apps and, and other ePro uh, for our studies that's just getting started. So we even had to look at tokenization service providers, software testing system providers, and so forth. So for me, in my role as the senior director, I've been trying to just really understand from the overall company's needs, what do we need to take care of COVID-19 related issues? And what can we look at this as more expanding for, for this uh, conference, looking at decentralized clinical trials? We were fortunate um, early on to do more of the uh, direct-to-patient than I think um, other companies had. And we had developed a, a great relationship between our home health company and our logistics company. And it prevented, so in other words, the IP is delivered to the patient's home by the logistics company to the threshold of the home. The nurse takes it, delivers the IP, collects specimens. The driver of the logistics company waits until they have uh, finished that. And then the nurse hands the specimens to the uh, logistics company that takes it and, and, and moves it along. So there's a lot more efficiency from the home health nurse not having to go out and find dry ice or find a FedEx room, and as well as the chain of custody has been superb. So that, that we, we were already involved in and it's been very successful and we're trying to build upon that. Um, secondly, we're going to our preferred vendors uh, we do have three preferred vendors currently, and uh, at least one of those is done an exceptional job on uh, decentralized clinical trials already. And so we're trying to partner with them, learn what they know. As a small sponsor, sometimes uh, we can be accused of being the Enron of, uh, of small pharma, you know, small biotech. Um, and so for me, in my role, I'm trying to make sure that the company does broaden its horizons and looks at all of the great opportunities that are available to us at this time. So that's been exciting. Um, and then, so, you know, looking at the category approach, I have in my team, we have category managers and they get assigned. So we don't wait for a study assignment. We're looking at this more as holistically within the company and partnering with our IT department and uh, data management and other uh, departments to make sure that uh, we do this right we get all of the um, all of the requirements down systemically and systematically, so we don't make mistakes down the road. So it's it's a it's a really exciting time. I think this has given us a time to look at how innovative we can be and working more in partnership with our vendors. I really enjoy what Chantal said about that partnership and really exploring and and doing things differently. And we've been trying to do that. Uh, we also hired a director of uh, monitoring and, and global site management. And that person has come on and really started uh, aligning, and we're looking at a potentially FSP model as well for monitoring. So I think I uh, will stop there, Rich, but thank you for the opportunity. 
Oh, that's yeah, and great answer. Part, Thank you. I feel Thank like you. three part, and a half for you, Mark. Hello. Hi, Jane. Go ahead. Uh, Janie, we'll, we'll, we'll do yours next. Let, let's let Tracy do this question, then we'll, then we'll go back to question four, okay? Thank you. Well, Tracy. Very similar, to, very similar to what Mark was saying. There's just a variety of different vendors that we're working with. And so in my role, I do the pre-screening and obviously receive the bids from them for the clinical trials. And so all of the things my colleagues have mentioned here, the wearables and the remote ICF and the... Um, Virtual meeting planners and the uh, all these types of things, but I think that from my experience working with the operations team, those virtual meetings, while you're never going to replace the face-to-face, -face, the value of the face-to-face -face meetings, some of the way some of these vendors are and these service providers are handling them have really impressed us with regard to pre-recording the information that our team is going to present at the defense or at the um, investigators meeting. And so then, and then they're creating this basically on-demand web so people can just go out and get that information anytime they want. And then they're very consistent information across multiple investigator meetings when you have, you know, say a large global study. So I just wanted to highlight that as one service that's been working very well for us under COVID. And again, face-to-face -face really is best, but I, I can see this being a part of our business going forward for sure. I've never heard of the ring. That's pretty cool. I haven't actually seen the ring. <laughs> I'll connect the, with the you aura. and share more. <laughs> yes. Oh, okay, so uh, Janie had some uh, some technical difficulties. So we'll go back uh, to question number four. Will you continue to use these tools in a post-COVID era? Great. So um, I'm glad you guys can see and hear me because um, it was very strange. Um, I saw all of you guys. Uh, my name is Janie Mandrasov. Mm -hmm. I'm the Vice President of Clinical Affairs for Providence Medical. It's a really small medical device company. So I think different companies experience COVID differently. And we were quite small uh, when we got started. Um, and what, uh, what I wanted to talk about was, you know, the uh, silver lining of technologies. But then now that nobody heard me, I'm kind of, not sure if I should talk about the silver lining of technologies, how great it is. So I'm going to, my silver lining is going to be a little less than I initially was going to talk about. But at any rate, uh, we started our trial in March of last year, ex ex when everything started to shut down. And um, uh, we were faced with an issue of how do we conduct our SIVs and what do we do, right? Because traditionally, everybody goes over to the site we bring in all documents, we do all our trainings, and we had to sort of pivot on a dime and figure out what to do about it. And so here is where, you know, I appreciated the technology ability to get on um, the meetings and the Zooms and conduct uh, the SIV remotely. The difference in how we conducted it is, is that we, instead of having one long meeting, we were able to arrange a few meetings, right, over a week where different people in different groups got trained and um, that was actually, I found this to be much more efficient, to be honest and effective, because you actually got a group of people to focus on things that you actually want to talk to them about versus having everybody run in and out. So that was that was an upside in my mind. Um, in addition, uh, we were able to bring more people from our team to meet with the people from other teams. And I, we talked about collaboration and having more people interact and work together. I think that's really been enabled by ability to have remote meetings because in this way you're actually able to get more people in the same room and, uh, you know, make those decisions not unilaterally but with all, all the stakeholders in, in the place. So I think the SIVs for us were very different. They were quite successful. And um, even despite COVID, we were able to enroll, um, set up all our sites according to our schedule versus um, and save a lot of money for the company at that because nobody was really traveling and getting to all those meetings. So um, so the other thing, the tool-wise, obviously DocuSign became a key player for us, right? So rather than have anything in writing, everything is now DocuSign. And, I would venture to say this process will go much faster, right? Because you could ping everybody and get everything in one place. So um, I will definitely continue to use some of these tools post-COVID. We would definitely fly over there and, and relationships are really, really important. But having group yeah. trainings and meetings, I think I would continue to carry them on with their inner remote fashion. So um, that's so I think these are cool tools. The other thing, of course, is in monitoring uh, we're saving a whole bunch of money because we're not shipping our monitors all over the place right now. You're right. 
<laughs> we are um, we have set up our we have an uh, investigator file with a PHI folder where everybody can drop in whatever they need to drop in if they wish to, and it's very well controlled and we can do this very very quickly. So for sure, we will. That's another area where I think uh, COVID actually was a silver lining, where we learn how to do this much more efficiently and quickly. So just wanted to comment on those two areas. Um, de definitely a new world uh, in executing clinical trials for all of us. Outstanding. All right. Um, great job. Great job, everyone. Uh, I, I, once again, I, I've said it, but I'll say it again. Uh, thank you for your well-thought-out responses, and uh, this has been very informative. Uh, I, I hope the audience uh, has uh, stuck around here. Um, so now let's go to questions from the audience. I'm going to go ahead and hit QA. Let's see if there's any out here. Okay, we have uh, one question. Um, Courtney mentioned. Um, Courtney mentioned. How do you did you communicate to the communities? Yeah, no, it's so, an excellent question. Um, so at Moderna, we've done again. Um, we were partnered with Operation Warp Speed, and through through the government, and that's when we did actually pause our enrollment to make sure that we were enrolling a diverse patient population. We brought in, we have, um, and built out during this phase three trial, a dedicated patient recruitment and retention group with dedicated people focusing on diversity and inclusion in the patient population. So we reached out, we did a lot of community outreaches um, with churches and community centers, our physicians. Um, it was really an all hands on deck effort, but we leveraged a lot of uh, community-based resources as well. Okay, so uh, and and how did you get in touch with those community resources? What, uh, because no one's there, right? You you had to go, you had to make phone calls, you had to write emails, and it was it just grassroots effort. It was really a grassroots effort, and some um, I'm not going to get the association correct, but there were some larger, you know, like uh, church associations that we reached out to in certain demographic areas that we knew that had those populations. And we also leveraged a lot of um, AI and machine learning to identify where these patient populations were. And uh, yes, to your point, Richard, grassroots. Uh, wow. Uh, that's something that I hadn't seen before. Right on. Okay. Uh, and then another question uh, coming in is that uh, uh, several of you have, have mentioned um, turning to ePro and e-consent, right, uh, as to kind of automate these. Uh, so um, – uh, our our questioner wants to know for the e pro is is this a bring your own device e pro or did you have to provision devices? Yeah, yeah. Bring your own device is not as typical as one would want it to be. Mm -hmm. uh, we are traveling in that direction, so we see there's a lot of complications because so patient reported outcomes. There are also clinician reported outcomes. So we kind of put them together, right? And they have to be within a certain um, format, depending upon the device. And the authors that hold the licenses to their questionnaires or whatever we're going to be asking patients or clinicians want it to be validated across all instruments. Yeah. And so that's why we tend to control it and we hold it. Um, so ECOA is actually, so I say ECOA because I'm adding the clinicians and the patient reported outcome. Mm -hmm. They are actually much easier than e-consent because e-consent impacts the way in which patients also enroll in whatever system you've created. So typically now, if you hadn't used e-consent, but you use perhaps a randomization, IRT, EDC type of interaction, now you can't have IRT be the patient number start and that changes everything and so that i think has become pretty complicated and that doesn't even get into the parts about so many irbs will not accept e-consent the other thing to warn not warn but to get you prepared for is using electronic patient reported outcomes or consents has to be in the protocol 
And typically you're not ready. So you got to go back to the IRB Mm -hmm. and get back in line. And that causes just a lot of confusion. And they want to have, you know, they want to have the information and they want to see it. That's that's from my perspective. Uh, That's what struck me. Uh, Totally. Um, Jennifer, what, what did you have to say about that? Uh, are you on mute? They... How about now? We got you. Yes. Okay. Yes. Also, great. So, EPRO in our case had already been in the protocol. Thank goodness. And so we had given all of our patients and sites. Uh, tablets. So they had a tablet, iPad tablets, and EPRO was already in 17 different uh, languages. So uh, the vendor managed, so it's almost like iPhone where they release a updates to all the devices and the, the site, all they had to do is accept, download, and refresh, and then all the information will be there the next day. The problem with that was during the COVID-19, patients couldn't make it to the sites they're either unable or unwilling and so they couldn't come to the site and so they couldn't really finish the 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 epro um, and the diary on on the site so therefore we needed to quickly convert that to paper pro and ship it over to the site and then um, our mom our study coordinators will call the patients on the phone and say you know number one how do you feel about it number two how do you feel about it number three Etc. So we had to adapt both ePro and the Paper Pro at the same time to kind of get through the COVID-19. And we successfully collected a lot of great information without a whole lot of disruption. But that uh, iPad tablet was the one uh, device that we used to administer yeah. ePro. Yeah, we use tablets as well. Yeah. It's a very expensive adventure. I can tell you that in general, I'm just going to say in general, million dollars. Uh, yeah, I, I'm a vendor, right? Yeah, uh, it, it, that it, it exponentially different when you're provisioning devices as opposed to just putting out a form, right, yeah. uh, on, on a phone. But it has everything to do with that validated instrument, and uh, there's no way out. If you have a validated instrument, y- you need to govern that tablet. That's just the way it is, at least <laughs> until one of you figures out how to do it differently. Um, yeah, what what a great panel. Um, so, uh, you know, um, that, that those are all the about the ring. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. Why don't we ask the question about the ring? So, sure. Sandy, is is the information that's flowing? Do a lot of sensory technology work. So, the information that's flowing from your your phys, physiological self yeah. is yeah. any of that data a primary endpoint? Because that's pretty well not allowed right yet. Yeah, it, it's not. It's observational. So it's really looking to link up if there's uh, data that can predict um, if you actually have COVID or other sorts of respiratory illnesses or things like that. Um, and it's, you know, all voluntary. It, and this was my personal ring. It wasn't purchased for me. Oh. So I think there's so I think that there's an option here that maybe we haven't. I mean, I, I feel like it's with. Any technology, there kind of gets to be a point where you start to see things happening. And at some point, we need to pull our <laughs> help pull along the regulations. Um, so, you know, it's all password protected. It's my app. I have agreed to share this data. And, you know, I know data probably better than the average person. I understand. But, um, yeah. but it also is uh, in a small way that I'm able to contribute, you know, on a personal level to this, um, the COVID, you know, uh, you know, this, this time frame we're in. So, and, and it's, it was a benefit to me because there were times I would get messages like, Hey, your body temperature's elevated, you know, you know, do you have other symptoms? Make sure you contact your primary care. So, you know, I can see some things about looking at it more holistically. Um, I, I know we're not there. <laughs> I've done a lot of e-consent too and e-pro. And um, so I know it's it's so much tougher um, to get things in place. But, you know, the reality is everybody did flex and pivot. I mean, really, it, it's amazing. And kudos. I mean, look at what 
I, Moderna, I, I just wanted to give you, a, you know, way to go. I know my mom just got her second Moderna shot. So I'm thrilled by that. Um, and I, it's exciting to see our entire industry kind of coming together because these are the important things we should be working on. I just wanted to add something to that. Um, we are, you know, we, we do have a preferred vendor that provider that is really involved in decentralized clinical trials and really gave us the insight that you don't want to retrofit your ECOA or other, other yeah. things. You want to build it from scratch when you're building your protocol. And I think that's a really good reminder. Uh, we don't, you know, I think sometimes we rush to get something done. But if we take a step back and talking a little bit about, again, what Chantal said about patient organizations and getting the, the voice of the patient more involved, I just think it's a whole new way of looking at how we conduct clinical trials and how we design them. So it's an exciting time in my mind. Um, yeah, you know, I, th I think the answer is around making this a patient-centric solution rather than taking older technology and making the patient fit it, right? And I think that's going to be the next step here is that, is that you know, I don't know if we're going to go to rings, okay, but it's going to go, uh, it, it's going to go around ways that it's, that, that it works for the patient. Um, and it makes it easier for that patient to be enrolled and to stay in the study and to collect data or contribute data, right? Um, and, and it'll be designed around them. And, and the tools that they use and, you know, with technology, who knows what we're going to have in three years, right? But, um, but, but doing that and then getting that information, you know, letting I people did. like us worry about getting that, right? So, I just um, what my talk was about, Richard, so I do. <laughs> it was yeah. emerging technologies. So you want to see that slide up. Right on. Right on. Um, so, can, I, uh, can I say, though, with, e, with ePro, so we put it out with patients with visual disturbances and body disturbances and I can go on and on and let me assure you they're the they're not the best at holding a tablet picking it you know things so you really do have to look at the patient population and make sure that you have adequate you know like a support system for them if you're going to use it so in other words you'd need to have like a caregiver or somebody with them in order for them to use a device that's a really great point, Catherine. And um, something I noticed, um, my like I said, my mom got her vaccine, but they were doing this all through the web. And so she's not quite as web savvy. So I was able to get like my contact information in to get the information, first of all, and then, you know, really run that caregiver route for her to facilitate it. Crucially important and thinking about who that person is. So um, I think those are great points, Catherine. And I thought your presentation today was great. <laughs> Thank you. It's the, same, it, it, yeah. it's the same with telehealth visits. Yeah. If, so in order for a physician to actually be a physician, you almost need another person in the room with a patient to say, you know, have him stand this way. Do you see this? Do you see that? It's like a two person. And we haven't really trained physicians to do that. So telehealth, I mean, I could go on and on and on because I study this all the time. But I do think that we are moving forward. But there are a lot of caveats for our patients, not for us as healthy people, but for our patients. Yep. All right. Uh, so final thoughts. Any any uh, any last comments out there that uh, that that someone has, uh, uh, you know, uh, developed here during this conversation? I'll just start. But I just want to say how much I appreciate the collaboration. And I think for me, that's really the what needs to happen going forward. There's so many challenges for us all to be doing this research and, and wanting to get, you know, medicine, needed medicine into the patients that have the most need. So I think, you know, whether it's a collaboration uh, forum, conference, just talking in general, I think, you know, for me, there's less proprietary worry uh, and more just let's share and get best practices and really talk about what we can do to, to be best for our patients. That to me is really important. Um, Rich, so my uh, two cents is, so we're talking, I'm going to go on from Mark. Um, everyone's looking at how can we make this more patient-centric, and we're, we're headed down the right path. There's a little um, switch that we all need to really pay attention to, and I think if we all spend 
you know, spend the next month paying attention to it and then the next year, like do it on a, a regular basis. Um, every time we're looking at something, we always, you know, we see a problem and it's like, okay, how are we going to solve this? What are we going to do? How are we going to get around this? Um, it is, we need to come up with some trigger in our minds where we all are reminding each other, okay, but let's also look at it from the patient's perspective. And let's also look at it from the caregiver's perspective or let's all ask them. And I, I think that's going to be key. Our intentions are awesome, but we're moving slowly to to actually being patient centric. And if we all have that mental, this is what I'm going to focus on for the next month, next three months. I'm going to make sure that everything I do, I think about the patient or the caregiver. Um, I, that's where I think we're going to see the fastest change because uh, we have to think about it. It won't just happen organically. Yeah, I think that's what we miss. We, we, you know, we stepped aside and we let Amazon and Google come in and take over health and try to become better at pharma because they got into the patient. They got through social media, through other avenues, they got there. And we really do need to use our experience to, to ban even with these sources to make sure that we have. So this internet of behavior, Sandy, when you talk about your ring, you know, how we all work together to know our physical self and promote health. And that's the thing about the healthcare system. We treat diseases. We really want to get better at preventative medicine as well. Yeah. So that's my uh, You know, uh, are, we, are we good? Uh, any, any other final comments? Um, okay, Ron? so uh, I, I, was asked, I was asked to moderate this group and, uh, and this group, you know, um, Jennifer, Catherine, Janie, Dr. Daniels, Mark, Sandy, Chantal, Tracy, Courtney, you've all been so easy to work with. Uh, you know, it, it, it just it, it, it's been a pleasure um, being the moderator of this group. And I will tell you that what I got out of this hour conversation was well worth anything that I put in. And, um, you know, uh, whether whether we attend meetings like this or whether we form some other kind of group to where we continue to share this kind of information, I think is really important um, because uh, I, I, I learned a ton and my mind is spinning uh, on, on, on exactly how we can do trials better. And, uh, you know, I just, you know, if we were at a real conference, I'd be buying drinks and I'd be, I'd be, you know, trying to suck up as much information that I can. Instead, I'm going to go make dinner in about three minutes. So, uh, so everyone, thank you so much. Uh, but uh, let's go ahead and our winner with our little group here. The orange I'm not looking. Hat. The orange hat. Go miners. Catherine. Really? Whoa. <laughs> thank you. All right. So. Uh, fifty dollar Amazon coming your way. <laughs> thank okay, you so, uh, much. so everybody, uh, uh, thank you so much. Really, a great effort. Mean it from the bottom of my heart. Uh, thanks for the effort that you put in, Sam. All yours. Appreciate your time as well, Rich. You've been wonderful as well. Always great working with you. Um, uh, th thanks again to all of our panelists and all those that are watching in this room. Um, if you guys have a moment tomorrow, please. Um, uh, drop by our conference as well uh, for day two of our summit in the agenda. Um, so if you guys have a moment, um, please make sure you guys um, take a drop by tomorrow on Thursday. Thank you, Rich. Thank right. you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Bye, Thank you. everyone, for attending. Well. Good night. Good night.